making the memory sensor slightly more depolarized than it would be if it were only due to potassium. Potassium equilibrium potential would be somewhere around minus 85 millivolts, but the actual measured memory potential, uh, the potassium concentration outside of 20 millimolar is less than that, it's more like 77 millivolts. And then chloride can also make a contribution, but oftentimes chloride doesn't really play any role because the chloride equilibrium potential is equal to the memory potential. So we can sort of cross that out. I did that in so we, we can, yeah, here, cross that here. Okay, and so then we talked about this, and then we talked about the memory potential that is steady over the short term. But, oh, sorry, before I, before I go to that. The other, the other thing besides taking into account all of the relevant ions is that this equation also takes into account the relative permeability of the membrane to those different ions. And so if you remember, the permeability for potassium is 10 to 100 times greater than it is for sodium. And this explains why the membrane potential is much closer to the sodium equilibrium potential in the minus 70s than it is to the uh, sodium equilibrium potential, which is plus 55 millivolts, right? Okay, remember that? From what's the Wednesday? Monday. Oh, from Monday. From Monday. So those, those are the two main things. And so this, this equation gives an even more accurate prediction of the cell's resting membrane potential, taking all of these factors into account. But if you let the membrane, if you did not account for the fact that, or if you didn't compensate for the influx of sodium and the efflux of potassium over time, eventually these concentration gradients between the inside and the outside of the cell are going to break down, and the membrane potential will wind down slowly to zero, and then all function ceases, right? So, um, right, that's what I just said. What prevents this from happening? We've already touched on that either Monday or last week. The sodium uh, potassium ATP. Remember, the, uh, the, this is an uh, energetic pump that throws out three sodium ions out of the cell for every two potassium ions that it brings back into the cell. And so this hump is distributed throughout the neuron's membrane operating in the background to essentially maintain the concentration gradients to the inside and the outside of the cell, okay? So it's electrogenic because it's, th it's, it's throwing out more positive charge than it's bringing into the cell. So this essentially would have a slightly hyperpolarizing effect on the cell's membrane potential, right? And so you have to take that also into account when you try to model a neuron's resting membrane potential. So the, the GHK equation goes a long way towards doing that, but there's also this pump factor. And it's, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not zero, it's small, but it's not um, completely negligible. And it usually contributes a couple of millivolts to negative minus millivolts to the cell's resting membrane potential, okay? So that's what I want to uh, finish up with, uh, with our discussion of resting membrane potential. So if the resting membrane potential is this based on GHK, it's actually slightly more negative than that because of the pump factor, okay? Clear? So now, next, I would like to talk about action potentials. <coughs> this is the outline that I'll be talking about for the next whatever hour and a half. And we've already, we've already had a large, a very amount, large amount of insight into how the action potential comes into comes into being because we have this huge driving force for sodium ions. There's an electrical potential difference. The inside of the cell is negative, so positive charge wants to go to the inside of the cell. There's also a huge driving force, a concentration gradient for sodium. Sodium's higher on the outside of the cell, lower on the inside of the cell. So it has a lot of reasons to go into the cell if sodium channels opened up to allow sodium to go into the cell. And that's exactly what happens in the creation of an action potential. So you depolarize the cell, 
then you have to hyperpolarize it back again, right? Um, I'll, I'll come back to that point in just a second. And we'll talk about the ionic currents that underlie the action potential. We'll come back to IV curves briefly, and then we'll talk a little bit about the biophysics of these, these uh, voltage gated ion channels that give rise to the action potential. So these are the learning objectives. You can read them at your leisure or not. So here's the action potential. So this, this is really amazing. This is a remarkable thing. You look at that, this is, this is an uh, electrical pulse. It goes from, I don't know, anywhere from minus 60, minus 65, minus 70, minus 75 millivolts, all the way up into the positive range. So it's on the order of 100 millivolt potential. And look at it, it's very, it's very narrow. It only lasts for about one to two milliseconds. So this is nature's way of creating a very brief electronic pulse, sort of like a TTL signal, an electronic circuit. And it's quite remarkable the way it's done so. And this is a very, very respectable electrical pulse. It's used by the brain to do things like stand in front of a class and talk and try not to make a fool out of yourself. So uh, let me uh, provide a few definitions of the action potential. So here's, here's the resting membrane potential. Something happens to the cell, it gets tweaked. You inject an electrical current, or maybe a sensory input is exciting this neuron, maybe it's being synaptically activated. That leads to a depolarization of the membrane potential. And there's a certain point called the threshold at which um, this depolarization either does or does not trigger the opening of voltage-sensitive uh, sodium channels, which we'll talk about in a second. If it does, the voltage-sensitive sodium channels abruptly open up because their threshold has been exceeded. They allow sodium to flow into the cell, and this gives rise to it gives rise to the rising phase of the action potential. So the action potential rises very rapidly because once a few sodium channels start opening up, the cell becomes more depolarized, causes the opening of further voltage-sensitive sodium channels because there's a voltage depolarization. It's sort of like a chemical reaction. It's like an explosion. Once you reach threshold, suddenly you're opening more and more and more until they all open up, and then you get this big action potential. Sodium, driven by sodium flowing into the cell towards its equilibrium potential, which is plus 55 millivolts or so, right? So that's the rising phase. Once it rises, it comes back down again, and it comes back down quite quickly. And one reason that it comes back down is because the sodium channels, once they've opened up, they start to shut, right? Actually, what happens is they're open, the channel, the channel is open, but they become inactivated, and I'll talk about that later. The channel gets blocked, no more sodium can flow into the cell. So that stops this rising phase. And at the same time, we need to bring the membrane potential back down to the rest of the membrane potential so we can generate another action potential if necessary. And so that's not due solely to the closure or the inactivation of the sodium channels, but we also need to invoke uh, potassium channels to help to bring this membrane potential back down. This is the falling phase. And so during this period, voltage sensitive potassium channels open up. They're a little bit slower to open than the sodium channels. Okay? Sodium channels open first, rising phase, in inactivate well, uh, voltage sensitive potassium channels, then open up a little more slowly, hyperpolarizing the cell and bringing it back down towards its resting membrane. And if you, if you look carefully, you can see that uh, most of the time, the membrane potential actually dips below the resting membrane potential. And this is called an after hyperpolarization. And the reason this occurs is because these voltage sensitive potassium channels are open so that potassium can flow through them. And potassium is flowing through the channels towards its equilibrium potential, which is usually much more negative than the resting membrane potential. It may be about minus 85 millivolts. The resting memory potential is only 60 something millivolts, minus 60 something millivolts. So during this after hyperpolarization, some of these voltage sensitive potassium channels are still open. Potassium is still leaving the cell, further hyperpolarizing the cell, and eventually they all close, and the memory potential comes back to its normal resting state. So that's basically the whole lecture in a nutshell.
Now I'll fill in some details. Oh, the other thing is, during the time that the molten sensitive sodium channels become inactive, they can't be opening for a certain period of time. And I'll talk about that later. But that leads to the so-called absolute refractory theory, which means that once an action potential occurs, you cannot, under any circumstances, generate another action potential for a brief period of time during this refractory period. Refractory meaning in, impossible to cause this action potential to occur. Okay? And I'll come back to that a little bit later. So, what happens if potassium uh, permeability increases dramatically? This is sort of a review. The last one from the last one. The potassium will flow out of the cell towards its potassium equilibrium potential, which is very negative, right? Will that give rise to an action potential? What happens if the sodium permeability were to increase dramatically? What will sodium want to do? Flow into the cell, cause an action potential. Sodium will move uh, the, uh, the membrane potential will approach the sodium equilibrium potential, which is plus 55 millimeters, as sodium flows into the cell, depolarizing, right? Okay. What happens if the uh, chloride, uh, sorry, the chloride permeability increases dramatically? The membrane potential will move towards the equilibrium potential for chloride. But usually this doesn't really, nothing, nothing really much happens because oftentimes the equilibrium potential for chloride is in fact at the cell's resting membrane potential. So chloride neither flows in nor flows out. Flows out. There are conditions in which there's a chloride concentration gradient. Higher salt water is higher on the outside. There's higher chloride concentration outside the cell and inside the cell. So if you to open up a chloride uh, uh, permeable channel, chloride ions, negative charge, will tend to flow into the cell, and that will tend to hyperpolarize the cell. And that's a mechanism that can be used by the nervous system to prevent uh, neurons from firing an action potential by hyperpolarizing bringing them away from the threshold to generate the opening for open sensitive sodium channels. Right? So, these are the equilibrium potentials for potassium and chloride. They're very negative. The only one that is positive is the uh, one for sodium. So that when sodium freely moves through the membrane, it's going to depolarize the cell immensely. And that's the basis for the action potential. So what ion is responsible for the rising phase? Probably sodium. I haven't proven it yet, but that's a very good guess. And it's very likely, and I think there's a lot of literature that now pretty much supports that idea, so everybody takes that as a true fact. So how do we know that that's true? Um, Hodgkin, Hodgkin and Huxley, both of whom won the Nobel Prize back in, I guess, the end of the 1950s or so, looked at how action potentials are generated for their work, they ended up getting, getting awarded the Nobel Prize because that's sort of one of the basic holy grails of neuroscience. How do neurons, how do neurons create action potentials that are used by signaling in the nervous system? And they used um, squid giant axon. I think I talked about those last time, right? Here's a squid. There's a giant axon that goes from the head towards the, towards the body. If the animal is stimulated or is, is, is fearful of being encountering some kind of predator. It generates action potentials in the squid giant axon that go down and cause the release of ink, black ink, into the water like a smoke stream, so it sort of disappears from the black ink, and it also starts swimming away. So, what effect, so they, they were interested in what are the ionic mechanisms that underline this action potential, which they can record in the squid giant axon to bathe basically in seawater. We talked about that last time. So one of their questions is, well, they thought sodium was probably important. What's the effect if you lower the external sodium concentration? <coughs> what effect would that have on the driving force for sodium ions to want to enter into the cell? 
reduce the external concentration. It's The sodium is responsible for the rising phase. What effect does lowering the extracellular sodium concentration have on the actual action potential itself? What would you predict if you did this experiment? Make it small, right? And indeed, that's exactly what they saw. So here's the uh, experimental conditions in which they lowered, lowered the external sodium concentration progressively. You see a progressive decline in the amplitude of the action potential. So this is sort of narrowing down the possibilities. It's very likely that sodium is involved in the uh, generation of action potentials based on these types of experiments. Okay. But there's more. So here we, I, I mentioned that here's the action potential. What, if, if you just had voltage sensitive sodium channels to generate the rising phase, and then you close them, is that sufficient to create this brief, short lasting action potential? And the answer is no. Um, once you depolarize the cell so much, you get a lot of sodium inside the cell, and you don't have any other mechanism to rehyperpolarize the cell, the cell's membrane potential is going to come down relatively slowly. So, they thought about this and they thought, well, actually it's coming down much faster than it would if only opening and closing the sodium channels were involved. So they said, well, how can we hyperpolarize the cell once it's become depolarized like this? They thought the obvious candidate, of course, is potassium. Because when potassium leaves the cell, the cell becomes hyperpolarized. All right. So that's the, uh, the obvious option. Potassium, voltage sensitive potassium channels that open up and bring the membrane potential back down towards the potassium equilibrium potential, which is not too far away from the cell's normal rest of the membrane potential. It's actually lower, so it can bring the equilibrium potential for potassium is actually lower, it's down here somewhere. So it can bring the, it can hyperpolarize the cell rapidly to create this very nice digital electronic pulse. So they realized that there are um, inherent problems in trying to figure out how this works. One is, um, that when current flows across the membrane, this changes the membrane voltage, which then in turn changes the conductance in these channels that underlie the action potential. So that's one of the problems that they had to think about and solve. The other problem is, how can they show that the, the currents uh, for sodium and potassium are through, through, through separate ion channels and not through the same ion channels? So they thought about these two questions. The first question, the solution for that was the development of a technique called the voltage clamp. So the voltage clamp is the same as the patch clamp that we've already talked about, except that it's, uh, you can clamp the voltage of an entire nerve cell, like a giant squid axon, or a squid giant axon. You measure the currents that are flowing through the membrane. And so this is what they did. This is the circuit. You do not have to memorize how the circuit works. The idea is that you can measure the resting membrane potential of this axon then you can depolarize the axon by injecting current. And then the, what the, what the uh, voltage clamp does is it basically clamps the voltage at a certain level and allows you to measure the currents that are flowing through the membrane when it's become depolarized. So that's the nature of the voltage clamp. As a digression, it's a little bit like air conditioning. When it gets, if you have, if you have a setting for your air conditioning system, if it starts to get hot and goes beyond the temperature setting, the air conditioning system turns on and tries to bring the temperature back down to the preset level, 72 degrees. That's like a temperature clamp. And the way that you measure how the temperature clamp is working, you know, how, what it's doing in order to maintain the temperature constant is the electricity bill. So the electricity bill is sort of like measuring the current that's going through this patch clamp, or this, sorry, this voltage clamp circuit, okay? So they can measure currents. So they have an electrode, a couple of electrodes inside the squid giant axon, which is possible because the squid giant axon is really big. It's like a millimeter in diameter. It's like a big, thick strand of spaghetti. So it's easy to skewer it with uh, multiple electrodes. So they can do this type of experiment. And so what they did is they applied this, pad, this voltage clamp circuit to a squid giant axon in the saltwater solution. 
And then they depolarize the axon. So when you depolarize the axon, you're obviously you're opening up voltage sensitive channels that are in the membrane of the axon that's becoming depolarized. Right? So that's being experimentally depolarized. Right? And so with the voltage clamp circuit, once they depolarize the membrane, they're able to actually measure the currents that are flowing through the membrane as a consequence of the membrane becoming depolarized and causing voltage sensitive ion channels to open up. So this is what they recorded, and this is da 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 Nobel Prize. This is, big, this is very important, very important finding. What they found is when they first depolarized the axon, there's a capacitative current that we don't need to worry about. This probably reflects the movement of the positively charged S4 segment within the voltage sensitive sodium channels away from the membrane. So they recorded that first. Then, the first, ignoring this, the first thing that they see is a large inward current. What is an inward current? Movement of positive charge into the cell. Which ion is very likely carrying this inward current? Yes. So, but we haven't proven it yet. But this is this is we're getting closer and closer, right? But interestingly, you have this inward current, which basically sort of turns itself off, right? An activation, which I'll talk about in a second. Followed by a delay or a late outward current. Which ion is likely carrying the outward current? What is an outward current moving a positive charge out of the cell? Sodium and potassium. So they were thrilled to see this. This is pretty cool. It's consistent with their hypothesis, right? But they really wanted to nail down how can we show that there's separate current carrying sodium and a separate current carrying potassium? So that's the next question that they would ask. Okay, so this is the inward current, this is the slower upward current. <coughs> So that, that's, the, that's the next question. How, to, how can you tell if these are, these are separate currents or they're flowing through the same channel and what's going on? And the solution to that problem is either to do ion substitution experiments, get rid of sodium, you lose the inward current, hopefully, get rid of potassium, lose the outward current, or use ion channel blockers using the, the then, at that time in the 1950s, the new pharmacology. And the new pharmacology is a little bit interesting, I think. Um, so here's, here's the normal inward current followed by the delayed outward current in the normal cell. If they take away potassium from the external solution, you lose the inward current. So that's most of the way there towards showing that it's, tech, it's sodium ions that are carrying this inward current. But at about that time, the um, chemists had discovered a chemical that's found, it's actually a poison that's found in food, the pufferfish. And this chemical is called tetrodotoxin. Here, it's right here. And tetrodotoxin is in high concentration in the liver of this fish and other organs. And this is actually a delicious fish. Meat is really delicious, and people like to eat it. And especially like in Japanese sushi restaurants. And so you need a skilled sushi chef, sushi chef who's able to take out all these organs that have this poisonous tetrodotoxin and then take the meat and, make, and slice up the meat so it's served as a delicious tasting sushi, right? Without killing the people that come to the restaurant by poisoning them with tetrodotoxin. So TTX selectively binds to a portion of, that's actually inside of the ion channel, the sodium, voltage sensitive sodium channel, blocks it, prevents it from opening, prevents any ions from going in. And so then the TTX will lose this inward current. So this plus the ion substitution experiments indicate very, very strongly that sodium ions are carrying this inward current. Occasionally one reads in the newspaper about deaths in a Japanese sushi restaurant because the person was poisoned with tetrodotoxin. The chef was not very good and didn't take enough didn't get rid of all the organs that contain the TTX. And the reason that TTX is lethal, sort of like some of the other drugs we've talked about so far, is that it blocks voltage sensitive sodium channels. What happens if you block voltage sensitive sodium channels? The nervous system can no longer make any action potential. What happens if you can't make action potential? 
comatose, stop breathing, you know the rest of the story, right? Okay, so I think we have a pretty good handle that the inward current at the beginning of an action potential in the depolarized axon is carried by sodium ions. What about the delayed outward current? Again, if you do the ion substitution experiments, you remove the uh, internal potassium, and you lower it, you, you tend to lose the external uh, the outward current, which presumably is thus being carried by the potassium ions. And there's another drug, not quite as um, interesting as the prototypes, called tetraethylammonia, which selectively blocks molten sensitive potassium channels. There are other um, more interesting uh, poisons that also act on the molten sensitive potassium channel, from scorpions and from poisonous snakes and so forth. And obviously, the effect of these poisons is also generally lethal, because if you block the molten sensitive potassium channels, you have these action potentials that stay prolonged for a long time, and the animal goes into an epileptic seizure. Okay, so adding TDA in their experimental setup, in this uh, voltage graph setup, you lose the uh, delayed um, outward current, proving relatively strongly that the outward current is carried, is a delayed current that's carried by the potassium. All right? Yes? Um, so on the previous slide, Yes. How does the potassium, how does the voltage gated potassium channel go there? Because we all the way pull that. Oh, this is from resting memory potential. Well beyond the threshold to open up these channels. The threshold is from the minus 65 or so millimeters up to maybe minus 50, minus 45. No, no. depolarizing all the way up to here, so this is a massive depolarization that opens all voltage sensitive channels, sodium amplitudes. Okay. okay. Here's a question. Oh, I've already answered this question. What happens if you ingest too much TGX? Tingling, nothing, death, hallucination. Probably all of the above, but the end, the end point is probably going to be death. Unless, of course, there's a anesthesiologist in the restaurant who has a, has a, uh, a pump, and he can pump ventilate the person. And this has happened to me. With people with TTA poisoning, if they get to the hospital soon enough, they can, they can be ventilated mechanically until they recover from the TTA poisoning, so they can be saved. So I always carry your defibrillator and your uh, breathing pump with you. Okay, so this this shows uh, this plots the membrane voltage and the function of conductance through the membrane. Remember, conductance involves the permeability of, of ion channels and also the concentration rate for given ions. And uh, this shows the potassium conductance in this off red color, and the blue color shows the sodium. And you can see that in a certain